Good afternoon, I'm Dr. Sarah Fee, ROM Senior Curator of Global Fashion and Textiles, and I'm delighted you could join us for today's Curator Conversation, a new digital program that explores themes and subjects from ROM collections alongside industry professionals. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that the ROM sits on what has been the ancestral lands of the Wendat, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Anishinaabeg Nation, including the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, since time immemorial to today. Today we're discussing the ROM's latest exhibition, Cloth That Changed the World, India's Painted and Printed Cottons, which is the first time the ROM is exhibiting its renowned collection of Indian chintz in 50 years. My name is Anjali Patel and I'm a fashion lawyer in Toronto. I advise emerging and independent designers on all areas of the law that impact their fashion business. I'm also deeply interested in fashion history, the business of fashion and contemporary culture, which will shape our discussion today. For the next 20 minutes, curator Sarah Fee and I are going to talk about the enduring influence and appeal of Indian chintz. We'll take a look at some artifacts in the exhibition over five slides. I'll ask Sarah some questions and she'll explain their significance. So let's get started. So I wanna start with a question that puts all of us on the same page. And so my question is, what is chintz? I think it's a perfect question for you, Sarah, as editor of the beautiful book that accompanies this exhibition. That is the perfect question to begin with, um, because the techniques for making the cloth is where the story begins. And chintz actually is just a general word for painted or printed cottons. It actually comes from the Hindi term chint, which just simply means speckled, but as you can see on the screen here, uh, what was created with the techniques was something extraordinary. And this cloth that we know as chintz was used around the world for both furnishing fabrics and uh, fashionable dress. So all of that is on display in our exhibition. But I think what most of us think of when we hear the word chintz today is actually what is English chintz, and that is industrially printed floral cottons, sometimes with very heavy sheen to them. And uh, when you hear that word chintz, you may think of your grandmother's curtains, uh, or you may think, as I do, of Laura Ingle Wilder's uh, printed chintz dresses, her colored <laughs> dresses. But our own exhibition, and I want to emphasize, focuses on Indian chintz. And that is the originals that actually inspired the English industrial imitations in the 1800s. And it was only in the 1800s that the term chintzy that we use now to refer to anything that's cheap or tawdry or uh, poorly made, shoddy, that actually uh, arose in the 1800s because English chintz had become so cheap and widely available. So we think that's how, where the word chintzy came from. So interesting. Yeah, I think most uh, people aren't aware of that, but you know, until the 1800s, it was India alone that mastered uh, the natural dyes and the colors and the cotton to produce these incredible masterpieces, and it actually controlled the global trade in it. Historians now say uh, a favorite pet phrase of theirs is that India clothed the world until 1800. Wow. Seriously impressive. Okay, moving to slide two. And so here we have two, I think, absolutely breathtaking and show-stopping gowns. Now, are these gowns displayed in the exhibition, Sarah? They are both on display together with men's fashionable wear too from the 18th century. Amazing. Um, so it may come as no surprise that the first topic I wanna to discuss is the law. And you did mention in your explanation of chintz, the idea of imitation. So, um, you know, my single favorite page in the book is chapter one, page 16, uh, which you wrote, Sarah. And it describes laws throughout Britain and France that ban the sale and wearing of chintz. So my take on page 16 is that essentially it's a list of fashion laws which created fashion crimes for which there were fashion police. Um, and punishment was serious, including fines, imprisonment, and even death. Uh, so my question is, why did Europe need to ban the import of chintz in the 18th century? Uh, well, that, that comes off of the expression that, that I just used that historians like today, which is that India closed the world. They also say that chintz was the first global fashion. And that's because in so many parts of the world, in Europe and in its American colonies, uh, cotton was actually rare. And cotton was different from linen, wool, silk, in that it could be washed 
and when you washed it, the Indian artisans were so adept uh, with their coloring skills that the colors just grew brighter. So it was, uh, a, became a fashion craze as soon as it reached Europe. You know, in small quantities were reaching Europe in the 1400s and 1500s, but it's really after the time that the Portuguese uh, sailed to India directly from Europe, followed by the Dutch, the British, and the French, that they start bringing it back in bigger and bigger quantities. So what happens is as the Europeans originally went out to that part of the world to get the spices. Well, they start making more money from these chintz and other cotton fabrics that are so novel in Europe that they switch to bringing back mainly fabrics, these chintz fabrics. What does that do to the local production of linen, wool, and silk in Europe? Well, it starts declining. So makers and merchants uh, up their protests. There were public burnings of chintz in protest. And the governments from 1700 to about 1750 enact a whole series of legislation to prohibit importing Indian chintz or wearing it. But laws always have loopholes and people trying to get around them so that you still have women wearing it in the street. And then there were laws that allowed the police to strip them of their cloth, uh, their fabrics in the street. Historians are finding that it was mostly middle class women who ended up paying fines or being imprisoned, whereas the elite women continued to just flaunt it. They continued wow. to decorate their homes with it and wear it as in these dresses you see here, because these dresses would be from the prohibition times um, when it was forbidden to get away with wearing it. Um, so that's, that's part of its uh, amazing story. And Daniel Defoe wrote quite a few um, tracks for the uh, wool, linen, and silk manufacturers to um, demonize the fabric and ridicule it and its wearers. But um, how interesting. <laughs> I'm just trying to imagine uh, public burnings of this fabric. Like, it's just so wild to think. Um, and I, I, you know, I guess I have a follow up question thinking about that. Um, how did the police distinguish between Indian and European made cloth since Europe was already imitating it, as you say? Um, you know, in other words, if I'm an officer taking someone downtown for selling or wearing Indian chintz, how am I making the call? Ah, it goes back to our building blocks, cotton, color, and design. Now, cotton does not uh, grow in Europe, except for a few pockets in southern Italy and Spain. So they had to always import it um, for their weavings. And uh, that made the linen growers unhappy. So there was a compromise that uh, British producers could make part linen and part cotton uh, textiles. But color does not adhere well to linen. So that would be your first clue that if you took out a magnifying glass, you would see that it was not pure cotton, but part cotton and linen. You would also, uh, the police would also recognize it by the color. Actually for mm, 200 years, Europe really struggled to replicate what you see here, these amazing reds and blues and purples and yellows and greens that Indian artisans could create. So the early European printed textiles tended to be more browns and grays and they could just not get this. They also lacked um, some of the dye plants that are indigenous to India. So that would be color and then design as well. And I think, and I hope you'll see when you visit the exhibition that there is just something whimsical and quirky and uh, individual in each handcrafted piece from India versus the more mechanical printed or copper plate printed fashions. So you feel life and warmth in them. At least that's how I've been able to distinguish between the Indian originals, even from a far distance and um, the industrial European imitations. So interesting. It's like the Indians had the French beat at their own game. It's kind of like the original couture. Um, each piece is one of a kind. Um, so moving on to slide three. Wow. Okay, I, I think this is stunning. Um, is this a jacket on the right? Well, what we saw in the earlier slide were, were women's fashions. And what we have here is actually our garment that would have been worn by an elite man uh, in Europe. Across Europe, if you were part of the elite intelligentsia, uh, you would have one of these robes called a banyan. It was an informal dressing gown. And in the catalog, we have a, a, an article on them by uh, Dr. Alexandra Palmer and describing both the form and the design on these. 
So you would wear these for relaxing in your bedroom or your study and receiving your guests. They were also very popular as um, garments to wear for your portrait because they never went out of fashion. They were in fashion for a hundred years, made of different uh, fabrics. And so your portrait would always be up to date if you were wearing one of these and show your status. That's so interesting that you say that because my immediate thought was, wow, this is such a timeless design. I would wear this now with trousers and heels. Um, I, I just think it's absolutely gorgeous. Well, just incidentally, they were based on Japanese and Persian prototypes. So you see the fusion of fashion in the 18th century. It was global. So interesting. Um, you know, it actually reminds me of the biggest impression that the book made on me, which was the worldwide appeal and influence of chintz at the time, um, but also it's continuing appeal and influence today in the world of fashion and interior design. I definitely came away from reading the book realizing that chintz is everywhere. Um, with that in mind, Sarah, can you give us some examples of how chintz was adapted for countries and regions, um, you know, in terms of cost, design, maybe there's other factors? Sure. Um, I alluded to that a little bit earlier by saying that it is considered the first global fashion. And part of that is, was because the Indian artisans would adapt designs to the various markets. And there would be tiny niche markets, say the Royal Palace in Thailand, that wanted very specific um, designs. And even within Europe, within regions, within countries. So the two pieces here I actually chose, um, and both of these are in the exhibition, to illustrate uh, two varieties. So on the right, we actually have the man's banyan that we were discussing would have uh, been made for the Dutch market. And we know that because of that deep red background, which the Dutch loved. And my favorite pieces, I must say, are the Dutch ones because they love those deep reds and purples and blues. Uh, what gives it away as well as is the, the Japanese influence on the design. The Japanese monopolized trade to Japan at the time and they became very fond of the Japanese aesthetic. So we find the prunus and pines that are uh, famously part of uh, the Japanese design vocabulary. On the left, we have a furnishing fabric uh, that would have been made for the French market. And we know that because this piece is actually closely based on um, designs that were drawn by the French court designer Jean Barin who was active in the 1700s. But what's interesting is the Indian artisans, they would have probably been sent one of his prints to riff on, and they replaced um, some of the birds with different bird species. Um, they put in the checkered floor. They added things that hadn't been there. So again, every piece was, was individual. That's so interesting that they took some creative license and you know maybe used his original design as a jumping off point. Yeah, I'll, I'll just say one, quick thing about that piece, which is worth um, emphasizing, and that is the British also love these white grounds, and they were actually very technically difficult to make. And so the Indian artisans, again, had to innovate to be able to create these because they take a lot of work and add a lot of cost. So I know we take them for granted today, but they were very difficult at the time. Wow. Um, you know, actually, maybe you can just sort of on that point, you know, why do you think that this uh, fabric is endures today and is still popular? Oh, I think there are um, different reasons for that. You know, it does go in and out of fashion and just my own informal um, sort of survey of it is, you know, about every, you know, 20, 30 years, it seems like each generation uh, finds something new in it. And you can see, you know, you can take the design, the florals and they bring this idea repeatedly of youth, innocence, springtime. So it's like each youth generation will discover that. In my own generation, I'm afraid to say it was Laura Ashley. So, which is why I'm, I'm hesitant to go back to florals today. But there has been with the, the, the new generation last summer, the Toile de Jouy from France, which was France's um, take on chins from the 18th century was back in again. I think because the design can be adapted as well. Mm -hmm. so easily so that you can update it and even the florals you know each generation uh, the victorian florals you can identify you know separate them from the 18th century version or our versions today it's just so malleable the design i think others um are attracted to the the natural dyes mm -hmm. and i would say that about indian fashion today there has been this return uh, love of 
the handcrafted, these heritage textiles, because they speak to identity, they speak to what makes India unique, they speak to its artisanal heritage. So within India itself, there is a huge demand today for both what we might consider, you know, traditional uh, design and also all new um, printed and painted design. It just, it can be updated and, and changed according to, you know, current desires and, and fashions. Yeah, I mean, being Indian myself, that really resonates with me. And, you know, definitely as I was flipping through the book, it was like light bulbs were going on over my head too. You know, I thought of historic designers like Fortuny and Babini from the 30s, Cashel's Liberty Print florals from the 60s. Um, I thought of the designers Bill Gibb and Ritha Kumar from the 70s, Christian Lacroix from the 80s. And to your point, you know, even walking by... Um, Dior on Bloor Street when I leave the ROM, um, I definitely remember seeing the toile uh, fabric installed in the windows. And I also do think of Indian designer Savya Sachi Mukherjee, and, um, to your point on this uh, revivalist uh, trend that's taken hold in India. So really, really interesting to see the enduring appeal um, throughout history over a hundred years and, uh, you know, present in the world today. Okay, moving on to slide four. Okay, so I think we're going to be focusing on um, the chintz fragments, the black and the white, um, and sort of the pieces at the bottom. But I just wanted to say that I am obsessed with this Tree of Life tapestry um, that's on the left. And uh, there's this gorgeous menswear shop in New Delhi called Vayu. And I was flipping through an old issue of Architectural Digest India from two years ago. And they featured the owner of the shop. And he has a really similar tapestry. And, you know, I was reading the caption. and He says that it's maybe one of a dozen that sort of remains in the world. And, and I do understand that they're incredibly rare. So I, I just have total heart eyes for this piece here. That, that's good. The reason I included it is I wanted to make sure that we weren't just focused on Europe and what India was making for Europe because it was making for the entire world. The Americas, um, you know, from the 1700s, the Pacific, Australia, Africa, for everyone. So this was actually an Indo-Iranian piece, so it um, appealed to uh, Persian aesthetics at the time and was one of the last types that was made and exported uh, in the 19th century um, until current times. Stunning. Um, so coming back to the chintz fragments, uh, fragments, the black and the white um, that we have here at the top, they reminded me of a chapter in the book written by Max Dionisio. And in the chapter, um, Max describes independent cataloging of chintz fragments in Japan, uh, which seems akin to an artist's catalog resume. And, you know, as I was reading his chapter, I was actually thinking of Japanese catalogs I've seen on eBay that are produced by unauthorized third parties. And what they do is they, you know, they document handbags and luxury goods by various, various European houses. So that's just one of the many things that I was thinking of as I was flipping through this particular chapter. Um, with that in mind, Sarah, can you tell us more about these Japanese chintz catalogs? Um, why were they being created? Um, excellent question. There, there are two types of catalogs, and we'll have both of them on display from the 18th uh, century. So to go back to my earlier point, um, it isn't just Europe that is crazy for the fabric, and it's not just Europe that was actually trying to emulate it. Uh, in Japan as well, their uh, cottage industries rose up to um, try to replicate it. And in the exhibit, also, we make the point that there were other world textile arts that owe a lot to Indian chins, including Indonesian batik. Everyone tried to do their kind of local spin on it. So in Japan, on the one hand, you had connoisseurs, elite families, who would collect uh, different fabric samples. And this was usually in relation to uh, the tea ceremony. So they would take uh, bits of fabrics that they would use uh, for um, in the ceremony itself. So it, at the bottom of the screen, you will see some of these Indian chintz that have been fashioned into pouches to contain these very prestigious um, Sencha tea ceremonies uh, implements. So we've got a teapot, we've got saucers and cups. So you would keep some of your fabrics and you put them in an album and it would show your, like any art collecting, it would show 
you were a connoisseur of the art, you knew how to select the best pieces, and also that you had the money and the connections to get the best pieces. So they were put into albums that could be, you know, preserved and also shared. Wow. The second type that you see um, on the screen in the right, and this is just um, part of the page that will be on display. Um, and if you look, you can see that actually the upper right image matches the fabric in the lower right. Um, these were actual books that were printed for local manufacturers, so they knew uh, the patterns and the colors of chintz, so that they could replicate them in Japan itself. So if you see the notations and the margins on the, the book um, image, those are actually instructing you on what colors to use because they couldn't, it was very expensive to print in color in the 18th century, so these are in black and white with instructions on how to make it. So again, this is just underscoring that all around the world, people couldn't get enough of it to the point that they wanted to make it themselves. Wow, the dedication is really impressive. Um, okay, well, you know what, let's move on to our fifth and final slide. And the last topic we'll discuss today is sustainability. So I only had to go as far as page seven in the book to start thinking about how integral water is to chintz production. And as you wrote, Sarah, water is key. Um, but India is running short on water. Uh, cotton growing and dying requires a lot of it. And demand for chintz has resulted in screen printing with artificial dyes and polluting runoff. So my final question for you, is there hope? Um, has there been any innovation in chintz production that makes it less water intensive? Well, yeah, I've got, there's some good news there. there there is hope for the future, and part of our exhibition addresses the sustainability issue. It addresses first uh, the topic of industrial production, how unsustainable it is, and this is we were becoming very aware of in the past year, um, the destructive uh, volume of consumption and production that is taking place. Um, but even within the handmade, there are still challenges. And as you mentioned, the big one is water. Um, natural dyes do take a lot of water. There's a lot of washing and rinsing in between um, the various steps. So you can use synthetic dyes, which are less water intensive, but they're more toxic for the environment. So we've got the two options. So we, we talk a bit about both in, in a film in our exhibition. So if you look on the left, you, you'll see um, a system for water recapture that has been developed by Malasina of the Bodhi Textile Studio in Baroda, Gujarat. Okay. And what she has uh, created with a, a water engineer is first of all, collecting rainwater. So that are these giant um, containers that you see at the top. So they are basically just relying on rainwater to produce their fabrics. They've also innovated this washing technique where it's like an assembly line, barrel to barrel, um, which really minimizes how much water they use. And then all of the runoff water is actually filtered with these calla lilies that you see in the bottom left that can digest the heavy metals. And so the water can then be used um, to water the garden. It, it becomes that clean. So that works with synthetic dyes. Um, the natural dyes, uh, as are being used by, if you look at the upper right, um, the, the Khatri families of Kutch Gujarat, which is uh, a desert, basically. And so with even less water, um, to spare. Now, the, wa the rivers they were using to wash their cloth in the 1980s dried up. And so then they turned to wells that were 20 feet deep. Today they're 200 feet deep and they're so iron heavy that it really dulls their colors. So they um, as well have begun using rainwater and these water efficient uh, washing tanks in order to be able to keep using the natural dyes. And um, just to uh, end on the contemporary and this idea of sustainability, uh, both in terms of the environment and artisans. We feature um, contemporary fashion by the fashion uh, company 1111 based in New Delhi. Nice. And they um, are committed to using natural dyes and also in design and silhouettes that minimize fabric waste and also to uh, working with the same artisan families. So that's another dimension of sustainability that people should be aware of. Um, when it comes to the handcrafted. That's amazing. Um, I, I love and I get the sense, obviously, that you know, the exhibition displays art, artifacts that are both hundreds of years old, um, right up to the contemporary, and how great that um, 
a company like 11, 11 is being given a platform in the exhibition. Again, it is one of our main points. It's not only Indian art and ancient art, but it's a living art that mm -hmm. survived despite all the challenges of the industrial age and is today thriving. Incredible. Um, in closing, I say again that the biggest impression that the book made on me uh, was the worldwide appeal and influence of chintz then and now. Um, you know, in fact, I was thinking about Miranda Priestley's devastating monologue in The Devil Wears Prada about the cerulean blue sweater. And I think you could substitute the sweater for Indian chintz and her takedown would be as searingly accurate. So I want to thank everyone for joining us today. And thank you, Sarah, for answering my questions. And if you want to learn more, you can buy the exhibition book on the ROM website. Take care, stay safe, and have a great day. We look forward to welcoming you to the real exhibit in late summer. Can't wait to see it. Bye. Bye.